so we will discuss that counter force on regulatory perspective we'll come to now we come to the third part of our session and um, which we covered in the first two sessions uh, basically uh, the public policy in a platform world and um, ai in the uh, and its impact on jobs now we are going to address what you what we touched upon briefly in both these sessions that the role of dpis in a platform world and uh, specifically you know uh, there is a school of thought which says that data could be another dpi uh, uh, india has tried a, a dpi in the fintech space through account aggregators where uh, i have control over my financial data and i can choose to share it or i can nobody can take it away from me uh, it uh, it i am the uh, owner of it and there are data fiduciaries created for financial data and those fiduciary will only share it they will actually don't share the data they only share the uh, they only share when a decision by a loan uh, giver is being asked and again you know there are a lot of rules and and it seems to be working uh, pretty neatly in that sense now the, 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 if we were to apply a DPI, and there is a DPI, by the way, for data sharing, it's called DEPA. Uh, it basically envisages that, um, now this is something that you know uh, I have been advocating for a long time, that if identity of every social media participant is real, in the sense that it is linked to Aadhaar card or his license, um, the chances of deviant behavior goes down on social media, but another thing happens, it is easier then to link that data to that real identity. And if that if if there is a layer between the social media platform and the user, which is a TPI, uh, it is possible to control, manage, and uh, 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 you know, basically use that data in more responsible manner. Um, your views on this uh, uh, use of DPI in the data world. Yeah, so uh, again, I, I, uh, I, I would agree that uh, use, having a DPI layer where a user can manage their data and can manage access to that data and how it is used would definitely give value back to the user. Uh, the, the the data surplus goes away and whatever additional data that you are uh, you know opening out to uh, any of these platforms i'm not taking the specific case of social media and whether it can stop deviant behavior over there but in general this this bargain that uh, we have been told for the last 10 years that uh, open out your data because you'll get personalization here you know where you're opening out the data and what personalization you get in exchange for that uh, so to that extent, I I I I would expect that uh, that that bargain would work in the favor of users. Uh, whether it helps solve the ills of social media or not, I'm not entirely sure about that because, irrespective of whether the data sits with the uh, you know uh, with the platform or sits with the user, eventually the competitive uh, uh, advantage moves to the point at which the platform convinces the user to share data. Like even over the last ten years. The data has always been inside the user. The user has given more and more data because the platform has convinced the user to give that data through behavior design and habit creation. And even if there's a DPI coming in and there are AI agents managing that exchange, there's still going to be new forms of innovation that are going to figure out how to get the user to open up that data. And eventually the user also wants to you know, uh, live in a relatively low friction world so these innovations if they solve for the friction for the user uh, and create a good user experience quote unquote uh, my key point is that a lot of the agency does come back to the user but uh, it whether all of this will solve the ills of platforms and social media I, i'm a bit more skeptical about that 
Uh, what what I think, and this is where the regulatory force comes in. What I think it does help with is now you have this uh, uh, this channel in between the user and the platform, which was not the earlier, which was which is the public technology, and that public technology now has the ability to see what that exchange is looking like and has potentially the ability to inject some kind of regulation into that exchange. That yeah. I believe uh, could potentially impact and influence the ills uh, on the platform side. So only if you see that third player of uh, public policy injected into public technology coming in, then I believe that uh, that's a holistic solution. So the public technology as a public regulator uh, is the uh, is what um, DPI is uh, mm -hmm. hoping to be in a lot of sectors. Okay. And um, it is possible to do it in certain sectors. Uh, like, for instance, it is maybe uh, in case of... Um, Social media, every sector will have its own peculiarity. And I, I don't know whether you have spent some time on thinking about how DPI, where DPI will be successful uh, and where it will not be successful uh, in creating a demand or in creating that layer or making that layer uh, interface possible. Uh, I think if you think about that answer more broadly in terms of DPI in general, um, uh, I, I I believe that, uh, you know, ultimately where new technology, whether it's DPI or whether it's private platforms, new technology, whether it's successful, it's, it's typically successful in resolving some kind of friction or costs that already exist in the market, right? So if you think about uh, platforms when they came and they reduced the friction of the middleman, they took the middleman away. And initially, that that narrative of over extraction was not there, so everybody was very happy uh, that the extractive middleman had gone away. So the cost of having that middleman went away, and the platform solved that. Now, with with DPI, uh, the the one place where I find it most uh, uh, difficult to see DPI is coming in and uh, uh, being successful off the bat is if they come into a place where platforms have already resolved that cost. And now DPIs are coming in and they're not necessarily resolving that cost, they're potentially increasing the cost. Uh, and a, a possible example of this is what's happening, for example, with food delivery in India, where uh, you know the, the cost of uh, uh, coordinating across demand, uh, restaurant and uh, delivery riders has been successfully resolved by a Zomato or a Swiggy or any of these platforms. And uh, they they succeed because they have that level of deep integration into demand side data that can inform their routing and uh, package stacking and logistics, etc. Uh, and if you now take, for example, a DPI approach to it, uh, and I've talked about it before with, with ONDC, uh, while ONDC is very commendable uh, across a wide range of use cases, in the specific case of food delivery, uh, I believe it it is trying to solve it ends up trying to solve a problem that has already been solved by the platforms. But with which with a DPI model and with a more protocol based approach uh, ends up increasing costs of uh, solutioning rather than reducing the costs any further. And so in those cases where a large centralized platform has already successfully absorbed the costs, we may have to see whether a DPI comes in and actually reduces the cost further or uh, it increases costs. As, as an example, reducing costs further if if uh, you know, an ONDC helps uh, a lot of Kirana stores specialized, but not uh, able to come online. If it helps them come online, that's great. It's reducing the cost of getting them online. But on the other hand, if you look at food delivery as an example, uh, if you don't have the demand side data, uh, as a logistics player, you are not able to solve the consumer's problem well and create a poor consumer experience. And so over okay, there, not being a platform that can work against you. There is a slight nuance here, uh, Rangit. Well, one, uh, there is a duopoly of food aggregators and that duopoly is actually increased prices uh, in the sense that they have they have buried the logistic cost and their profit in the and added it on top of the restaurant price hence the price that the consumer actually pays is much higher and because of cartelization between these duopolies the prices are actually the same across things so there's a food aggregator price and there's a restaurant price okay and the difference is almost 15 to 30 percent and that that now that cost is not transparent okay the, mm -hmm. the restaurant cost and aggregator cost is not transparent okay. uh now the only way ondc can 
make it transparent is by having the aggregator's price on the platform and the restaurant price on the platform. So you have two different prices. So then the consumer has a choice between, oh, the restaurant is actually charging me 200 rupees and the Zomato is charging me 250 rupees. So where should I order from? Okay. So uh, uh, like in the case of UPI, uh, the market basically... Uh, the consumer got onto the platform because it realizes that the cost of transaction was zero uh, between any platform, any wallet to any bank account. Hence, they, the wallet didn't have any choice, but there was still a push. There was a push from the regulator, a nudge, if you want to say it, that if you don't come on the UPI platform, then you would sooner or later will not be able to transact with the banks. Now, in this, the same situation is happening in a different way in ONDC. The platforms are not willing to get on to ONDC because they know that transparency of pricing will happen. Okay. So it's like a, it is, uh, it's a no-go from day one. Okay. Uh, hence, there is no demand for from the consumer side. Okay. When there is no demand from the consumer side, the market does not expand. So there is no rationale for a Swiggy or a Zomato to join a pl new platform because they say that our platform is big enough. We are a duopoly. We have all the restaurants. The restaurants are not moving away. So why should we go to another platform where we'll have to share our restaurant data or our, you know, our uh, supply side data? Mm -hmm. And they have spent enormous amount of money in creating the consumer side, which is you know they've spent money on marketing, on advertising to get onboard customers, uh, you know, they've spent money on onboarding restaurant. So do you think the solution for a DPI like ONDC lies in a regulatory push to make it compulsory for platforms to be present on ONDC so that consumer demand gets created by transparency of pricing? I don't think so. I think uh, that, uh, you know, something like ONDC is particularly suited for certain verticals and is less suited for certain other verticals. And that's true for any technology. And I, if you if you don't choose the right vertical, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, it, it bringing in a new technology, even through the regulatory push, does not solve the problem. It might only frustrate the consumer more. Uh, if I just take a simple example, in the case of uh, ride hailing of food delivery, uh, the, the key uh, point of failure is not whether supply is available or not. Supply is available and supply can be brought on board and you know restaurants are happy to come on ONDC and there are tons of companies who are, who are thinking of building buyer apps on ONDC because they feel the cost of getting into this space has collapsed. Uh, but the problem is that the uh, point of failure in food delivery is is not really whether the restaurant supply is there as much as whether the food is going to be reliably delivered to me on time and whether I'm going to have one single uh, neck to choke in case something goes bad. And that thing kind of disappears with a protocol-based approach. So there are other verticals where supply is more differentiated and getting the differentiated supply on board, uh, which is not yet digitized, may have a lot of value because buyer side apps may come and solve the logistics problem over there which is which could be much simpler themselves and uh, getting access to the supply would be the choke point so if you just think of these two different things uh, you know is getting access to a wide variety of differentiated supply the key problem you are solving or is uh, uh, you know the vertical in which you are playing is that largely the quality of experience determined by the logistics of receiving that product uh, I believe, you know, something like ONDC is more uh, suited to solving the first problem and less suited to solving the latter. And that's the challenge that happens, you know, with uh, going after the food delivery or ride hailing as a vertical versus going after, say, artisans in a particular village and getting them online. I think that is where but, something like this gets uniquely uh, uh, creates value. But artisans are, will never scale up to a degree that the GMV is comparable to a uh, an Amazon or a Flipkart, you know. Yeah, no, I mean that's a that's a separate point. I mean, my my point is when you uh, create a protocol of open inventory and you try to solve a logistics problem, uh, the 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 solution that has been created and the 
place where the customer experience is breaking down are, are, are distinct. Uh, but, you know, if, if, uh, if the eventual goal of ONDC is to bring all of commerce in India online, uh, and a lot of it is offline and the you know getting it online would be the key choke point in certain use cases then i would say in those use cases it would still have a right to play and and food uh, you know delivery and ride hailing are potentially not those use cases because they are very well solved and the problem was primarily a logistics and a restaurant rating problem both of which are not you know solved on your ondc specifically okay i'll take uh, to another issue which we discussed in the previous um, session what role does DPI and the so-called data interface layer has in the platform plus AI world? And um, can AI be actually be used for societal good? I mean, uh, you know, it's it's a very broad and philosophical question. I okay, let me I, simplify it. Let's take the yeah. first part of the question. Uh, yeah. Just that, how can AI? How can a data in interface in the form of DPI help in managing or controlling AI platforms? I think it goes back to uh, you know the point that we discussed a little earlier that uh, you you need to solve that opacity problem, and if you can solve that opacity problem through that data interface, uh, even though it's not really regulating the the entire model, it is regulating the uh, additional delta transaction that the user is having with that model in terms of providing that data and getting value out of it. So to the extent that uh, you can inject yourself over there and see what is the, you know, uh, 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 what is the um, uh, trading advantage that a model is getting because of the data that's coming in, is the user getting sufficient value in exchange and capture sufficient uh, data at this level in terms of how the model is behaving what the model is taking is the model complying uh, in terms of uh, the, you know the value versus the data uh, that becomes a solution to the opacity problem that we started out at the beginning of this discussion so to the extent that it, it is a solution to opacity I, I i would think that there's a possibility there Thank you very much, Sangeet. Uh, appreciate your time and uh, effort in explaining and helping us transfer this world of platforms that are increasingly getting complicated, not just for the, uh, I think, the engineers who work in these platforms, because they, I don't think so they understand how that platform works. But I mean, the world at large is also not understanding how these platforms are shaping uh, with the combination of AI. So appreciate uh, your time and effort in uh, helping us understand this. Thank you. Thanks, Atish.